but we're all gathered here together because clearly golf has played a special part in these people's lives and through golf they have played a very special part in our, our lives. And they are really uh, visionaries, they're pioneers and leaders in the truest sense of the word. And what we're here to do today is to learn from them, to hear from them, and hopefully even to challenge them uh, on the things that they have done, the things that they intend to do. And some things that we know need to be done that haven't been done. We want to find out why they haven't been done and what we can do not only to have them do things, but have us get some, some hands and feet and eyes and ears and the leg and see if we can participate in doing those things. So I want this, we're going to hear from them first. We're going to hear from each one of the panelists who has an opening statement. And after that, I want this to be as interactive as possible. This should be a learning information. I want people to have uh, an opportunity to ask questions. And so without further ado, let's uh, uh, introduce our first panelist. Um, Ernie Ellison, Jr. Ernie Ellison, Jr. joined the PGA of America in 1997. He is the Director of Business and Commun Community Relations. He created initiatives that continue to position the PGA of America as a major golf industry leader in the areas of diversity and corporate responsibility. Ellison, a great ambassador for golf, strongly encourages people of color and women to become involved by playing the game of golf as well as, for the, op as, well as the opportunities to have successful careers and business careers uh, within the golf industry. Uh, Ellison, uh, Ellison's professional career also includes years of service within finance at the IBM and Unisys companies. Ladies and gentlemen, Ernie Ellis. I wrote that for Michael, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, to Congressman Clay and uh, Les uh, uh, Frank Davis, I really uh, appreciate very much the opportunity for, and your vision to look at golf a little differently and have it as part of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, this is the first time, uh, as, and I think it's uh, well deserved at this point in time, and to be done by a leader who's an avid golfer like um, Congressman Clay. And my only hope is that uh, we'll hear next year talking about some of the great things that we accomplished from this point going forward. Um, uh, confession, I, am a, I was a tennis player, and I played a lot of tennis until I joined the, uh, the IBM, uh, PGA of America. And when I first went in for an interview at PGA, uh, one of the guys who, who had uh, asked me to come down for an interview also came from the IBM company, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, you, don't, you, you didn't play golf, and you don't know anything about the golf business. He said, why did you come to PGA? He said, because they wanted the other skills I had. I said, well, he said, if you come here and do what you did well at uh, the IBM company and the other companies you were worked, you're going to be very successful in, in, in golf. And so that made it a little easy for me. But I find that I, had, I didn't know anything about the golf business. Uh, I always considered myself to be a very um, well-rounded person until I stepped in that bu building and had no idea that it was a business. And over the years, we've learned how big this business really is. Currently, the last economic impact study that was done in 2005 <clears throat> indicated that, that, that the golf industry the, in the U.S., direct golf-related goods and services, is seven to six billion dollar industry. That's larger than the motion picture business, very large. And when you add on the surrounding components of that, golf is a hundred and ninety-five billion dollar industry. Within that number, it is sixty-one billion dollars in wages that are being paid to about two million people. So you have to ask the question, well, why haven't we known these things as African Americans? Uh, because many of us don't play the game, and we never really view it as a game that is a business. So the message I'm trying to get out there very loud and clear is that, yes, we want to get as many people as we can to play the game, but we certainly want you to understand that there are some careers in this game. There, there are ownership uh, opportunities in the game. Uh, there are supplier opportunities in the game. Um, if you look at the board positions, you know, there's a focus on getting more and more people get the boards more diverse around the world. Well, golf has a lot of boards because this consists of a lot of small businesses. And uh, I, I just strongly feel that uh, if there's one message that I can leave with you, and that message is 
that it is a business. It's a sport, a very important sport, where all the things that you're going to hear about in terms of life skills and what have you are great for our kids, but if they understand and you understand that there are careers that they can have in this business as PGA professionals, as LPGA professionals, as lawyers, as doctors, as accountants, it, some you have to play the game well to be successful in this business, but most of them you don't because most of that two million people don't play golf. So, uh, and I would like to see us uh, really <coughs> become more aware of this and find ways that we can educate our kids and find out the processes that we can go through to get them become more aware of careers in golf. So my opening statement is uh, it is a business and I really think we need to focus on the aspect of it being a business as, as African Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know how it's difficult to introduce somebody who you know because they say you the bio and it's tough to cut stuff out. You look at everything and say, yeah, that's important, that's important, that's important. And so this one's going to be a little bit longer. So I hope you bear with me because um, I know too much about him to leave too much out. Uh, golf was once regarded as a privileged sport and it's undergoing a major metamorphosis. And Garvin has had a ma Jimmy Garvin has had a major hand in uh, evolving access to youth in the Washington, D.C. area to the game of golf. Uh, his dream of a major league baseball career, which is a very talented uh, player, fell short when he was stricken with an arm injury that cur curtailed his professional baseball pursuits. He turned his athletic focus to a new passion, golf, and we're all the better for it that he did that. Uh, following six years in the hospitality industry, uh, I'm going to say Jimmy, uh, was recruited by golf course specialists to oversee Langston Golf Course, which is the first golf course built specifically for African-American play by the government. Very significant property here in Washington, D.C. Everyone should see that. Um, he took on the challenge of organizing a support staff to efficiently and effectively run this historic facility with dignity and with pride. His mission, he felt, was to galvanize the presence of the facility in the minds of the contiguous community through outreach and what better focal point than with the youth. From this effort, the Langston Legacy Golf Corporation was born on April 1st, 2000, and Mr. Garvin was named president. Jimmy completed the United States Golf Teachers Federation instructional course, making himself a certified teacher as well in the year 2000. And with this new role, Garvin challenged himself to create a unique golfing experience for junior golfers. He co-founded the Langston Interpretive Education Center, conceived on the premise that all junior golfers participating in the various uh, programs would first be challenged in the education center prior to any challenges on the golf course. Jimmy has received many honors and awards, including being named president of golf course specialist in 2007, thereby becoming, I believe, one of three African-American uh, corporate heads of golf course management companies in this country, and being inducted into the African-American Golf Hall of Fame in 2006. Jimmy Garvin is involved in a number of organizations and events that benefit the local and international community. And to all golfers, Jimmy stresses his five P's, planning, patience, persistent, preparation, and possibilities. And wherever he goes, he always chants his motto, golf is the carrot, but education is the key. He is a leader, he's a humanitarian, and I'm proud to call him a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Garvin. Thanks, thanks so much, Michael, for that warm introduction. Uh, the first thing I'll say is I thought it was going to be tough following Ernie, but I think it's going to be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this distinguished panel uh, that uh, Congressman Clay put together today to talk about our challenges as it relates to golf in our community. I think that most of us understand that there's a need for support Support has to come from within, uh, starting with oneself. You know, what can we do to change the lives of our young folks? Most of the time we look at the outer city kids as the kids that have the best advantage as it relates to golf, but my thought has been to focus on the inner city kids, the kids who will never be exposed to golf. So we've done a great job of trying to expose them. Uh, we have um, foundations throughout the country. We have a foundation down in Naples, Florida, which we started to support underprivileged kids. Uh, we ventured to St. Lucia. Uh, interesting story, we were in St. Lucia um, two years ago and we introduced the game of golf to some 75 kids on Saturday. And uh, we had another clinic for the, the rest of the kids on Sunday and 150 kids showed up. So exposure is going to be a key to our success moving forward in terms of how fast and how far we'll go to get kids involved in golf. 
but as Michael said, I, my true belief is that uh, it has to start with education. Uh, golf is going to be a great sport to be a part of, but if our kids are not educated properly, then they cannot do anything else outside of golf. If they don't become professional golfers, they're stuck. So my mission is golf is the care, but education is the key. We start with A, B, and Cs. Uh, we installed interpretive learning centers throughout the country to support that process, uh, get our kids educated, and they become good citizens. From that fall forms a community which can support itself. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll have more to say later, but as for my opening statement, I have two words to leave with you, and it's access and exposure. We have to do a better job with both of them. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Junior Bridgman. Ulysses Junior Bridgman is the owner and president of MANA Incorporated and ERJ Incorporated which currently oversees the administration and operation of over 280 franchise restaurants that presently employ approximately 9,000 employees, making him the second largest franchisee in the United States. And as the franchise line, tagline goes, I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Bridgman holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Louisville in 1975. And in his spare time at Louisville, he played a little basketball which led to a stellar 10-year NBA career with the Milwaukee Bucks and Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, Mr. Bridgman's leadership skills have, were further developed through his 11 years with the NBA Players Association. Uh, he is actively involved in the Louisville community. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Fifth Third Bank, the Library Board, the West End School, Jackson Hewitt Board, the PGA Board, and most recently joined the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. He serves as past chairman of the Board of Trustees of the University of Louisville. Bridgman Foods has received many uh, prestigious awards from Wendy's International for both organizational and operational excellence. And he has also received an array of awards for personal achievement, for leadership, and community service. Uh, Mr. Bridgman and his wife Doris are the parents of three children, Justin, Ryan, and Eden. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, man who's been successful in at least two lives and is probably on the way to two or three more. This is Junior Bridgman. Uh, thank you. And it is indeed an honor for me to be involved with the panelists here and uh, thank Congressman Clay for, for putting us together and, and allowing everyone the opportunity to hopefully present more about the game of golf. Uh, I, I, as, as was stated, I, I'm a, one of the independent directors on the board of the uh, PGA. And what that means is uh, normally, uh, well, there are two people that are independent directors. And everybody else that represents a section of the country on the board uh, that's a director comes from the world of golf. And so for me, it's an honor because I, I wasn't a PGA professional and, and didn't grow up playing the game of golf. Uh, but what I know they'll be able to tell you a lot more about uh, you know, the game of golf and the opportunities. Uh, one thing that the board has, is real proud of and been working on is, is establishing uh, what they call a PGM a degree, a professional golf management degree that you is now uh, at 20 universities uh, uh, where you can go get a degree in golf management. And so you don't have to be a tour player or a Tiger Woods to, to, to get a career in, in the game of golf. I'm sure it's something that we can talk about a little bit later. But for me, I grew up playing basketball. I mean, uh, if, when golf came on TV, turn the channel. You know, I didn't want to watch, didn't, it was boring. It was all those things that, uh, and there was no, nowhere to play, so golf wasn't that important to me. And it wasn't until really uh, I got in the NBA that uh, uh, Bob Lanier came to our team and introduced our team to the game of golf. The reason why he did that was so he could beat us out of money every time we played, <laughs> which he did. Uh, but through the game of golf, and we're talking about for kids, the one thing that I would, would really want to stress here quickly is, is the business aspect of it. And Ernie talked about business aspect from, from the game of golf is a business, but I would just say that the game of golf offers you the opportunity as a kid to get involved in other businesses. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the game of golf is the only game where you can spend four and a half hours with another individual. And in that four and a half hours, they're going to learn about you. You're going to learn about them. They're going to learn about what you do. You're going to learn about what they do. 
And you're going to learn, is there a fit? And there may not be a fit, but there is at least an opening and a connection. Best example I can give, uh, uh, Wendy's franchisee had about 15 stores and had the opportunity to play with the then CEO of Wendy's. He said, come up to Columbus and let's play golf. So I was a mm, fair golfer, but he took me out to Mirfield, big time course. And I invited a friend of mine to come along. So we're playing to CEO another executive from Wendy's. And we've got a $10 bet. At the end of the round, somebody's going to lose $10. Well, he wasn't as good as me. So <laughs> going into the 18th hole, we were up. And so I looked at my friend Al who was playing to me. Al had a putt that would close him out. I said, Al, do not make that putt, <laughs> whatever you do. And Al missed the putt. They won $10. And today I got 161 Wendy's restaurants. So it was probably a good investment. So. But what I'm trying to say, that, that the game of golf, when you spend that amount of time with somebody from whatever industry, it may be somebody you had no idea you'd ever meet as far as a charity outing. It may be someone that you always wanted to meet. But our kids need to understand that the game offers them access to areas, to people that they probably would not be able to ever get involved. And they can use that to grow into other areas in their life and get involved in other businesses, other opportunities. And so that's my opening statement and the point I'd like to make. And now I'll turn over to real experts here. Thank you. <laughs> you sound like an expert to me, right? You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Right? Uh, let me next introduce uh, Ms. Renee Powell. Professional golfer and educator Renee Powell is one of only three African-American women to ever play on the Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. She is the daughter of the late William Powell, the only African-American to design, build, and own, and operate a golf course in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Powell began playing golf at age three. She entered her first amateur tournament at age 12, won her division, and she's been winning ever since. She made her professional debut on the LPGA Tour in 1967, and she competed in 250 professional golf tournaments. In 1980, Powell finished her tour career and taught golf in Africa and Europe, and later returned home to Canton, where she currently serves as the head professional golfer at Clearview Golf Club, which was named to the National Register of Historic Places by the US Department of the Interior. She has been an ambassador for the game for this country and for this country for all of her adult life, and her many awards and honors include an honorary doctor of laws from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, the first female golfer to be so honored. She is indeed. <laughs> she is indeed the first lady of golf. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Renee Powell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Congressman Clay for, for hosting this and for uh, really bringing golf to the Congressional Black Caucus. I mean, this is great. And, and thank you to uh, Mr. Davis for, for all of your help. Um, as, as you see, I started off very, very young. So I've been playing golf for a few years, a <laughs> little, little over half a century, actually. Um, but I started off, uh, my dad got me involved with the game of golf at the age of three, and, and he became involved because he fell in love with the game as, as a young age, too, as, as a youngster of nine. So he, was a, uh, he grew up uh, um, learning to caddy and learning to play golf at the same time. After high school, though, he found out that he was no longer welcome at the same same courses that he played as a high school student and, and when they had their team matches. They started, he and his older brother started the very first high school golf team in their small town where their family was the only family of color. And sort of to fast forward, my dad then, he was a veteran of World War II. He was in Scotland and England during, in the European theater during World War II and was able to play all golf courses over there. He came back to the United States and found out he was no longer welcome to play, still no longer welcome to play the area courses that, uh, that he grew up in. And so he then decided that what he would do is to somehow, some way, with his knowledge, with his determination, and with no money, Built a golf course, of which he did, um, and uh, and that was in 1946. So, a few years ago, and um, 
but he always he always felt that that golf was a great sport for youth for youngsters and he said what he found fascinating when he's he uh, saw them building this golf course back in 1926 he said they were hitting the golf ball and they weren't running to get it they were walking <laughs> to hit it again you know as a youngster he was used to running to you know get the ball and and hit the ball you know and to throw the football or basketball or baseball or whatever and he became so fascinated by this sport and felt that what a great sport for young people. And he, throughout his entire life, has always worked, had always worked very, very diligently in teaching and educating young people in the game of golf because it does teach so many lessons of honesty and integrity and perseverance. I mean, he was such a great example of all of those. And um, so as he... Uh, taught all of us, taught our entire family to play. I learned to, uh, I played golf in junior golf tournaments and collegiate tournaments and the amateur and then ended up in professional golf. So I went from being a professional golfer to being a golf professional where I now have been able to spend a lot of time educating young people. And the thing is that, you know, I think that years and years ago, now, I played here in Washington, D.C. back in 1959 at Langston Golf Course. Played a junior tournament there. So it's really uh, sort of nostalgic coming back into this area again. And I went out to actually to, to Langston today. But um, back in those days, there was an organization called the UGA. I don't know how many people in the audience will remember the United Golfers Association. Some of you who are maybe my age <laughs> or older. But it started in 1926. And because of the fact that there were no courses around that we, people that looked like me, could play, uh, they started, they, except unless they were uh, city courses like Langston and East Potomac, I think, were the two here in this area. There were a couple in Chicago and Detroit and the various cities. Well, the UGA had programs for youth, too, for youngsters. And so they had their member clubs. It, at, Clear, at Clearview, we had the Clearview Par and Birdie Club, and all these clubs had programs directed to youth. Now, for some reason, we've gotten away from that. We've lost that. And the youngsters were not just taught golf, but they were also educated. They were talk, taught about life. They were talk, taught about things that you could do by using golf as that tool, using golf as that carrot. And somehow, as I say, we've gotten away from it. So I think that we, as we've gotten older as adults, have, uh, have sort of lost that. And we need to get back to educating those, showing those youngsters at golf that it can, there is, there's a beacon of light at the end of the tunnel. And they can do anything and everything from the game of golf. You don't have to be a pro golf professional, as, as uh, Junior said, in going into business. I mean, there are things that I'm, throughout my life I've been able to to, uh, to write, I've been able to design clothes, golf clothes, sports clothes. Uh, I've been able to do some commentating and teach and play the game. But there are so many different areas. It's allowed me to travel the world to teach others uh, throughout uh, the continent of Africa and elsewhere in the world. But I think that, that we need to get back to really allowing the kids because they don't always see, you know, a lot of them want to maybe become professional football players or basketball players or baseball players. But when they meet those other athletes, those other athletes say they wish they would have taken up golf at a younger, younger age. So all of those basketball, football, and baseball players also love the game of golf. So I think what I really want to say is that, you know, we need to make sure that, that we educate them to all of our young people to the benefits out there. You know, it's when you think about uh, uh, playing a round of golf, it's four to four and a half hours, but you don't even think about it. And you're getting exercise, mental, physical, and exercise for the soul, too. And... Um, you know, I know the First Lady talks a lot about her. She's taken up obesity in youth. And, you know, uh, playing golf, it's going, you need to eat properly if you're going to do it well. Uh, you're going to get your exercise. You're going to sleep well, you know. And so there's so many positive aspects there. So it probably is making sure that they understand the benefits that are there, uh, not just, you know, going out and hitting the golf ball, but there are things a as we go along that that whole educational part, B 
being able to get scholarships as they go on to school and educate themselves to where they need to be in later life. So um, I think that's where I, I just, those are my sort of my opening statements that education and, the, and all the benefits that there are for our youth in golf and that we need to show them and to be the beacon of light for them, show them the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Wisdom. Um, I want to now uh, go on to introduce our next panelist, uh, Rodney Green. Rodney Green is currently the director of golf at the Innisbrook Resort and Golf Club in Palm Harbor, Florida. And Innisbrook is owned by Sheila Johnson. That's right. I'll say it, Sheila Johnson. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. Uh, Rodney oversees all golf operations at the 900 acre resort, including daily oversight of all four of the resort's championship golf courses, merchandising for three golf shops, golf instruction, staffing, and managing the PGA Tour Transitions Championship held each year in March on Innisbrook's Copperhead Golf Course. Uh, a 19-year member of the PGA, uh, Green spent the last 11 years working in Orlando for the Walt Disney World Company, most recently as head golf professional and director of instruction for Disney's two premier championship golf courses. Green also managed and oversaw the PGA Tour's Children's Miracle Network Classic and is a member of the PGA Advisory Board and the PGA Diversity Committee. Uh, he is truly a rising star uh, in this industry and we are very anxious to hear what he has to say about this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, Rodney Green. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman, for the invite. And, you know, obviously, um, this is a great honor for me, but, you know, this is a homecoming for me. I'm born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland, and, uh, and I've been around this area all my life. And, and as I look around this room, I just see familiar faces. Uh, I've known Jimmy, you know, all my life. And uh, my uncle, actually, uh, his name is Al Green, and he's a member of the African American Golfers Hall of Fame as well and was inducted. And Malachi, don't make me call out a wrong year here, but I think it was a couple years ago, maybe, or a few, or maybe he's not inducted yet. But my uncle's name is Al Green. <laughs> And, uh, and, and he, that's fine, and he, um, and, and actually, that's actually how I got my start. Uh, you know, I've been in the golf, been around golf all my life, and so I've been very fortunate where a lot of people were not exposed to it at a young age, and I was exposed to it at a very young age. And, uh, and I played golf uh, in the Maryland area, and I grew up, as a matter of fact, uh, I played my high school state golf championship at the University of Maryland. And out of 148 golfers, I was the only black. And that was in 1980, uh, but 1980, I was the only black. And, uh, and, and at that time, I had never heard uh, of another black golfer, and I had gotten an offer from South Carolina State. And I remember my dad and I drove down to Orangeburg one summer, and I had never seen another black golfer. I thought I was the best black golfer in the world. <laughs> and uh, I never saw another one. It had to be. I had to be the best one. And uh, so when I got down there, there was a cat on a team from Mobile, Alabama, a dude from the Bahamas, a dude from Charlotte, and, and they beat me like a drum. I mean, beat me like a drum. And I said, Dad, this is where we're going to school right here. And so I went to South Carolina State. And, uh, and when I graduated, I turned pro. And I went out and I, uh, I chased my ball around, as we call it, and, uh, you know, lived in the back of my truck and did that whole mini tour thing for a while. And, uh, and then I had gotten to a point where I realized that, you know, my game just quite wasn't able to get to the next level, but I knew I wanted to be around golf, and golf was my love and my passion. And so that's when I went the business route. And Renee said it a little earlier. She said that uh, I am a golf professional. Um, and everyone, there's a difference. I am a golf professional. And what you see on television on the weekends are professional golfers. And that's the difference. I'm a golf professional. We run the business side of it. And so uh, I, I put the effort in and, and got my membership into the PGA in 1992 and became a Class A member. And, and I don't know the exact numbers. I think Ernie could probably help me as well. But probably out of about 24,000 uh, Class A PGA members, there's probably less than 50 in the world, African-American Class A PGA professionals. That are Class A's. There's a lot in the internship programs and working toward it. But there's, there, there's not 100 that I know of that, that out of 27,000, 26,000, that's a pretty big number. So. It's a distinct group to be in, and we know each other. We, we, we know them all. And, uh, and, so, and, and, and so getting my Class A at the time, um, I worked everywhere around here. I worked at Haynes Point. Uh, I worked at Tantallon. I worked at Indian Spring. I worked at Queenstown Harbor. I was an assistant pro at all of these golf courses around here in this area, and, uh, and I got my break. Uh, I got my break. I was 37 years old when I got my break, 
And, uh, and as we talk a little bit further about this today, we'll talk about what the, per the patience and the perseverance, how it pays off. Uh, I was 37 years old when I got the job at the Walt Disney World Company. Uh, and that was my first head pro job. And I went down to Disney and I said, hey, you know what, I'll stay here for a couple years and see how it goes. And I was there for 13 years. And, uh, and, 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 and my story is a testimony more than anything else, but, but as, as blessed as I am, uh, I got a phone call about a little short of two years ago um, from a friend of mine who said that uh, Sheila Johnson had bought a resort uh, over in Tampa, Florida, and she was looking for a director of golf. And they said, Rodney, do you know her? And I said, no. I said, I don't know Sheila. And they said, you know what? This might be a right opportunity for you. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm good. This mouse is, is, is good. I'm going to go ahead and hang here and, and hang out with this Disney thing for a while. And, uh, but again, if you know how it is when your calling is somewhere different. You have to go where your calling is. And my heart was somewhere different at the time. And so I, uh, I went over and I interviewed for the job. And I was very fortunate. And I got the job. And, and I am now the director of golf at the Innisbrook Golf Resort. But more, but more importantly, uh, after meeting Sheila, uh, for those of you who don't know Sheila, Sheila is, is one of those kinds of people that immediately when you meet her, she, she is just the most warm, graceful woman I've ever met. And she embraced me. And the very first thing she said is, I want you to learn how to do all this. And I said, yeah, but I'm your director of golf. She said, no, you, you, you didn't hear me. I want you to learn how to do all this. And so now I'm spending time with f and B. I'm spending time on the resort side. And so, you know, she's teaching me how to run a resort. And so anyone who's in my position to have an opportunity to learn and grow like that and have someone to mentor you like Sheila Johnson, I, again, it's just blessed is all it is. I mean, keep it, keep it real. And, uh, and so, you know, I have, you know, and so and as we go on, I mean, we could talk about the educational piece and some of the ideas that I've had all my life about starting an internship program. And Sheila said, what, how fast can you make it happen? I mean, these are things that now I'm calling Ernie and saying, hey, I need to get some, some kids in here to work from the PGM schools. And, and like Junior said, when I was in high school, my boys teased me. Man, did they tease me. I played golf. Back in the day, you played golf. And then I went to South Carolina State, the fellas on the football team. You know, we used to hit balls, you know. And you know what? Now, I'm $150 an hour, fellas. You come see me. You come get a lesson. And, and you know what? And every one of them now play golf. They all play golf. They all play golf, every one of them. And when I used to take them to the golf course, they just wanted to ride around in the golf cart. That's all they wanted to do. And now they understand the business implications of being in the golf business. And that's exactly what he said. Everything that they said is 100% true. And, and I am that full circle. I, I'm that kid who played golf and got teased and did it all. And, and, and I stayed with it and persevered. And now... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm where I am, and I'm loving every minute of it. I mean, it's, this, is, this is what it is for me. It's my passion, and I love it, and so I'm blessed to be able to do what I love to do. So we'll talk some more. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much. You know, another little-known fact, um, you can remind Sheila that uh, when I was a little bit younger, Sheila Johnson was also my music teacher yes. in, in middle school. She's a very accomplished Probably. musician. So after she finished teaching you the resort business, ask her to give you some piano lessons. All right. All right. <laughs> she can hook you up. <laughs> uh, our last panelist for now is Dr. Marshall Banks. Uh, Dr. Marshall Banks has an extensive background of over 40 years of teaching, student advising, uh, research, grant writing, curriculum development, and community service in the areas of health, physical education, and recreation. Dr. Banks has been on faculty at Howard University as a professor since 1978. He also served as chairman, department chairman, of Health, Human Performance, and Leisure Studies, formerly the Department of Health, Physical Education, and Recreation, uh, for the last 20 years. Dr. Banks is currently president of the Langston in the 21st Century Foundation. This foundation, in collaboration with the Jimmy Garvin Langston Legacy Foundation, has successfully developed after-school and summer programs and research projects that include Langston in the 21st Century, Learning Center Initiative, Extra Physical Education Progress, the PEP Initiative. Projects under Dr. Banks' stewardship have received over $3 million in public and private funding. He is the money man. Dr. Banks has an extensive publication record in major journals and one book in the field of physical fitness and recreation leisure studies. He is a scholar, he is a coach, an instructor, a teacher, a mentor, and a friend to many in this city. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marshall Banks. Again, uh, thank you, Michael. I certainly appreciate those uh, kind remarks. And uh, Congressman Clay, this is truly an opportunity and a joy. We certainly appreciate this. And I think all the panel members are expressing this, is that this concept 
that you have put together and with the help of your staff is going, uh, this is a beginning for us. It's a beginning. It's a beginning step. This is the first time we've tried it, but I think what the panel members are suggesting to you at this particular point is that um, we just need an opportunity. As you listen to the panelists in their opening remarks, it's not a lack of knowledge and know-how. It's the lack of opportunity. And today, I think that's what we're pre projecting, that we're ready. As Rodney said, he was ready when he stepped up and said, it's time. And my involvement has been uh, with the project now with Jimmy for the last 10 years. In the beginning, uh, I was asked to join uh, a project that was going on at Langston in the year 2000. The state of uh, the city of Washington was beginning to pull together a bicentennial celebration to celebrate 200 years of the United States. And to select a project for each quadrant in Washington, they selected Northeast Washington John Mercer Langston Golf Course. And so at that particular time, they asked uh, when I come on board and, and, and take a look at this project because I'd been doing fundraising in golf at Howard. And I went to Jimmy and asked him if I could join with this concept of education. His background in, in reference to being at Howard, and I, he is a student of mine from Howard University. I've been there that long. <laughs> but the deal is that he had the concept of developing the golf side, but I said, let's introduce this education piece. And my introduction to that was in 1985, I took a leave from the university to go with working with a group that had begun to develop a, a, an education program for the Job Corps. Uh, Dr. Robert Taggart pulled together this project and uh, he was basically saying that if we bring members from the Job Corps in, they need education as well as these job skills. And so he developed this program. And my initial piece was to go on board and work with it to bring on young boys and girls transition from high school into college on, uh, as a student athlete. <coughs> And so from 1985 until now, I've been working on this particular project, but I've changed it a little bit. In 1996, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Congresswoman Curtis Collins as a, a member of a group called the McIntosh Commission. And the McIntosh Commission was put together just to challenge the NCAA in reference to their use of SAT scores for initial entrance for freshmen. We successfully challenged them. We asked them, you know, is this the best instrument that you could come up with to determine whether or not a student entering as a freshman would be successful? And they basically argued and said yes, and Congresswoman Collins provided us data from the NCAA that said that using your own data, this was the worst predictor. In fact, it was less than 40% predicting success the best suggested uh, curriculum was graduating from high school with a two-point GPA. That was all that was needed because the group that we initially tested uh, in 1985-86 successfully entered the university without taking an SAT and all of them, 85% of them graduated with a B average and that's all we needed to know. And so we challenge them now, there's no major issue with that. I took the same concept to Langston, working with it. We have over 400 kids we do deal with in the summer. They learn how to play golf and they also learn this academic piece. And so our thrust is that if we can produce the most technical piece to these kids, that is technically, they don't have exposure to laptop computers. They don't have exposure to the internet. They don't have exposure to learning while they're on these programs. And that's what we've done at Langston. And from that combination that we started 10 years ago, we now have students in college. We will graduate our first student next year and Destiny will finish uh, this spring graduating from the University of Richmond in, with a bachelor of science degree in engineering, and she also plays golf. 
but we are entering students every year. Uh, I teach a golf class at Howard, and I invited uh, Ms. Powell to come by a few years ago to give us a golf clinic. But I, in the class the other day, a young lady came up to me, and she said, Dr. Banks, do you remember me? And I said, no, not quite, because I've, I have quite a few students every year, and I couldn't, I remembered her face, but I couldn't remember her name. She said, three years ago, you gave me a check for $2,500 from Langston Golf Course to help me get started in my college career. She's now a junior at Howard University, and basically that was the bottom line. Our students are coming to Langston, they're learning, they're getting involved, and they're being admitted to the university. And so what I want to do is leave today is this idea that, you know, if my concept dealing with the NCAA, I was br only bringing a few boys and girls to the college level. Those who were the superstars, the junior Bridgman, the, the crew that could play and get involved, but we weren't getting to the masses. We had to go into an after-school program, a recreation program that got to the masses. We have over 400 kids at Langston every summer. And so at this particular point, we have to figure out how can we get this education piece to the masses. It's okay to build character with NCAA athletes, but it's an extremely, extremely well-desired composition for our kids to say, will I have an opportunity if I don't play basketball or football? You have an excellent opportunity throughout the United States. Every major city, we're trying to get this program in. So Congressman Clay, this is a start for us, and I certainly appreciate it. And we'll, uh, I'll close now, but I think this opportunity, and we'll entertain your uh, responses, and hopefully get this education piece over. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, uh, Michael, before we begin the Q&A, can I just uh, uh, again say thank you to this excellent panel we have assembled. Uh, you have shared with us your stories and experiences, and they are remarkable in, them, in, in, in themselves. So again, thank you all. Can we show our appreciation to this panel? That's true. I, I join uh, Congressman Clay in uh, thanking this panel because we could do two hours on any one of these individuals uh, and have a very rich and fulfilling discussion with any one of them. For, for all of them, to have the opportunity to sit down with all of them is a great opportunity for all of us indeed. And we do thank you. Um, I'm going to take uh, the reins for a minute and uh, try to drive this train a little bit, ask a few questions and see if we can't uh, challenge you a little bit, get some thoughts from you, and then we'll also get some questions from our audience. I'm sure you're anxious to uh, interact with the panel. Uh, first, I'm going to turn to uh, Ernie Ellison. I know that you had a statistic that you wanted to name because the uh, number of Class A PGA pros uh, came up during the, uh, the opening comments. Anything think you had a number for us? Yeah, Roger, what, uh, uh, Rodney wasn't that far off, but uh, we have 28,000 men and women professionals uh, and actually there's only one African-American female today. There's some of the apprentices, and the African-American female is actually Renee May Powell. It's not a problem. We, we don't like to say one of, but that's where we are. And uh, in, the, in the men's side, um, we have um, uh, uh, 143 members and apprentices that are African-Americans. Again, not proud of it, but, but the more important thing is that how, what are we doing to try and change that? Um, uh, in the audience, and we're very proud of this, is one of our professional golf management universities, which is the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and that is the first African American, um, a predominantly minority institution period that has this program, and it's been around since the early 80s. Um, and what, what happened there was, I, I tracked the numbers, and I went to see my management and said, listen, we have all these you know, institution with the professional golf management program, and at the end of the day, I don't see our numbers changing. So the recommendation was, what do you do? I said, well, we go to Historic Black College. What do you think? So uh, fortunate for me, Dr. Thomas Thompson at that time, uh, there was an article, she did an interview, and, and said that she was interested in bringing golf to her uh, campus, 
And that letter got on my, that, that uh, newsletter got on my desk and I immediately got down, to, went down to University of Early Eastern Shore and started talking this. And, and the program now has 43 students. Uh, they have met and exceeded all of the requirements that over any other university that has this program. And they have 12 um, African American students and one of these students is Mr. and Mrs. Garvin's granddaughter. So uh, that what's happened, and seven of the students from that program are coming from the junior, uh, J the Jimmy Garvin's junior golf program right here in Washington, D.C. So when you hear uh, that transition that we're talking about here, making awareness, it's actually working right here in D.C. in the partnership with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. That was going to be my question. You just went ahead and answered it anyway. Out in front as usual. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to speak to one thing about uh, the professional, professional golfer versus the golf professional. And I always used to say that uh, for the golf professional, uh, and it's maybe an oversimplification, but for uh, the golf the professional golfer, golf is a living. And for the golf professional, golf is a way of life. And they sort of bring us closer to the game. The golf professional gets us connected to the game. That's more their job rather than just going out and win, winning money like that. Um, so for the uh, professional golfer, and you said they have the, the professional golf program. Right. If we have so few African-American uh, golf professionals you know, in the industry, um, is there any effort to have these people who, are, who have achieved that level become mobile and to become sort of mentors around the country? Or are, are they sort of located and implanted in, in particular courses and locations? And what can we do to have those people become more visible and more mobile around the, uh, around the country? I'm going to throw that to Ms. Powell. Wow. Well, you know, I, the ones that are golf professionals mm -hmm. are at various clubs around the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that those who are uh, at, or at various locations are, are doing programs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they have their, their own programs that they're, that they're doing, you know, whether they're in Arizona or Florida or, or Ohio or wherever. But I, all of those, and I think that everybody has uh, an interest in, in trying to get more of the youth and more minorities, whether they're young people, youth, or whether they're women, more more women into the game of golf, but uh, as you know, for, as far as minorities, so we haven't uh, put together uh, an effort to travel around because really everybody's doing their job at their club or at the course where they are. Uh, but certainly, you know, that's something that that maybe. Uh, could be put together to, to try to see how we could embrace and get more uh, more young people and more minorities and more diversity in the game. And that's something that maybe Ernie, I don't know, I should probably could throw it back to Ernie as to. Did you write that down? Uh, I've got it. Okay. How we can do that. <laughs> we recorded too, so. Uh, that. Fortunate, there, there is a, a group of uh, African American professionals. It's called African American Professionals Making a Difference. And we're trying to um, embrace that organization now to do exactly what you, you ask. But, but I, I think the, what has to happen is it has to start at the top. Um, the, the diversity to me is not just the, the youth and pushing up from the bottom, but in order to get these real deep-rooted changes that we're talking about here of inclusion, we, we need more people like Junior Bridgman, more people like Rodney Green, who are in those leadership positions because they can dictate things to happen. Uh, more people like Congressman Clay say, why aren't these things happening? And uh, to understand that this is such a, 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 a big business and, 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 and why aren't there more, 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 more golf professionals? Well, and, and, and yes, the processes are there, but the, 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 the drive to, to change it at, uh, has to come from uh, all the different angles, the pushes, the pullers, and, 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 the, and the hit them on the backs and go get them. Um, and I, I think what we're trying to do is, you know, we're working in a vacuum because we're not doing as much reach, outreach to bring in the experienced um, minority professionals to help us get there. And this is not rocket scientist work. All we have to do is follow patterns of the other corporations to get there. So, so I, I think your point is very valid. We need to do more embracing, but, but certainly we need more people like the Junior Bridgman to say, why aren't you doing these kinds of things? 
terrific. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to pause the question and answer session for one moment because I think our last panelist has arrived. So I want to introduce her, uh, let her get the opportunity to make her opening statement, and um, then we can perhaps resume the questioning with her and just let her jump in and sure. get warmed up. So uh, Kelly Martin uh, is uh, with us. Kelly Martin, as, as executive director uh, of the First T, uh, Ms. Martin continues to oversee the development and management of the chapter network but also manages and leads the, the strategic development of the life skills and national school programs and services that target opportunities for the First Tee to advance its mission. Ms. Martin is a native of Florida and a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Virginia School of Law. She has been a member of the First Tee staff since June 1998. She is energetic, ambitious, intelligent, and we are very anxious to hear what she has to say. Thank you for joining us, Thank Kelly you. Martin. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> hi, good afternoon. Um, as Michael indicated, I have been with the first team now for almost 13 years, the 13 years that the organization's been in, in, in existence. And we, a little bit about us, we are a youth development um, organization that happens to use golf as a vehicle for teaching young people the values and the skills that they will need not only to be successful on a golf course, but in other areas of their life. Um, we have a network of about 204 chapters that are located predominantly here in the United States, but we have five international locations as well. Our chapter network is locally based. Um, they are comprised of individual not-for-profits throughout different communities in this country, um, same overseas. And we also have additional delivery channels where we're reaching out to young people and we're taking a game of golf to where we find them most, which is at this particular point in the school. So we have a, a national school program that is introducing the nine core values, what we call the nine core values to young people, to give them an opportunity to get exposed to golf, which is a sport you don't typically see in the schools and certainly not at the elementary school levels. So we're giving them that exposure and also teaching them values that they might not otherwise get in the school system. And we've just recently added a third delivery system, which, is, uh, which has been formed in conjunction with the Department of Defense. And we're delivering our program to the young people, the children of our men and women of our military. So we are constantly looking at ways in which we can expose young people to the unique values that the game of golf brings to it. And we are looking to diversify. Our network is almost 50% um, diverse participants and about 30%, or excuse me, 40% female participants. So we are unique in the sense that um, we are definitely focused on reaching an, an audience that has not typically been exposed to the game or had the opportunity to play it. Terrific, thank you. Your point is well taken and we will talk uh, after, after we're done here. Oh, one more here. Then. Thank you very much. Uh, Selena Johnson from Detroit, Michigan with the Hollywood golf program that's 30 years old as we speak. Number one, Johnny does best what Johnny does most. And this alludes to the opportunity that's regional around the country. Um, some areas are able to play around with good weather. In Michigan, we go year round, but we have to go indoors. So there are regional situations that we must address but I'm very proud to, to be here because I'm getting ready to address a problem that's in Detroit with taking over a golf course. Now, I have Jimmy Garvin that's gonna work with me. I'm very glad to know that, that I could go to him and he's gonna come and help us do some things to keep golf going. The infrastructure of most major cities, these golf courses now are going through another change. So if we're able to get the golf courses, and you have golf programs, this is a good time to try to get these courses so that these young people can practice. Okay. I think we have one more down here, down front. <laughs> well, thank you. I just had one quick question. You mentioned earlier about um, sports agents uh, involved in golf. 
Um, would there be, what opportunities are there for minority sports agents in terms of representation of the, of the uh, players and could they play a role in the development of uh, golfers the way they do in sport with football and basketball, et cetera? Uh, um, yes, <laughs> but the, I, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough to tell you how that process will work. Um, I've actually had some conversation with IMG to ask them if there are ways that they could uh, mentor, create an internship for uh, a, a, an individual of color that really wanted to get into the uh, agency side of the business. And they're looking at it, but they're very slow because they look at how can we generate revenue. And that's the big thing with these corporations now, that they're, they're, they're not as focused on the, the outreach and charitable and diversity angle as they are in terms of making money. Um, and uh, somehow, you know, we, we, we need to look at very closely how can we get at least a little more opening there to, for, for a little more room for um, um, internship and development programs in those areas. But I, I really don't have a great answer for you. Well, and you know, and I was going to say too, and I think part of the challenge is too is that the, the knowledge that, you know, golf is not a quick return investment. And I think the challenge is when most people are putting up hundreds of thousands of dollars on somebody, they want some return. And you may put up a hundred, and, and Tony, and I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. How you doing, man? Good to see you again. And, and, and I think what happens is, is that when you put up that kind of money, you know, you may not get a return on that. You know, the, these, these people who put up this money for Michelle Wee, she's just now starting to do it. She's been out there for six to seven years doing her thing. And I think that's the challenge when we're talking about these athletes who say, we got athletes who want to get, who got this money. Okay, but they, if, if they give you, you know, half a million dollars, when am I going to get my money back? And you know what? You might not even get it back. And, and I know some, some young cats down in, in Orlando, which is the golf mecca, this little kid, Ty Tryon, this kid was a beast coming out of high school, a bust. Hadn't heard from him since. Hadn't heard from him since. So that's a part of the challenge. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm talking with, with Ray as well, is, is trying to find, I'm not talking with you, but I'm saying listening to what you said earlier about trying to get some sponsorships and some investments and people putting up this money, they have to understand that if you put this money up, it's a chance that you're taking. And, and that's where I think most people are a little bit pumping their brakes a little bit when it comes to giving these kids this money, white or black, is that, you know what, I might not get nothing back from this. So in this economy today, you know, are people going to be investing this kind of money and you may not get anything from it? That's, that's just the real of golf. And because like you said, you don't come out of college and golf and sign a five-year, $50 million deal. No golf. Tiger didn't do that. And he was the man. And he didn't. Well, Nike hooked him up, though. But nonetheless, you don't he didn't come out with a deal on the PGA Tour. You got play to keep your card. You know, I, I know guys that have made a million dollars this year and lost their card last year and the next year literally made three million dollars this year and are unemployed next year. That's golf. So it's a chance. And most people aren't willing to take it. That's the, only, the deal. The only thing I would add that if you're an agent. You probably represent more than one sport, athletes more, more than one sport. I, I would still go to a group of people with means and see if they would put a fund together, maybe corporates, but more likely it's going to be individuals. And uh, so if, if I'm an agent, I want to get into golf. I, I get this fund set up, and I say we're going to we're going to invest in five key players, and you got to go identify them, but. I'm not just looking for the return on his players. I'm going to put money into the agent agency. So as he represents guys from football, basketball, baseball, I'm going to get money. I mean, I'm not just relying upon golf, and that may be some way you could get that done. Because one out of those five might be successful. Final question. How you doing? Uh, my name is Frederick Thomas. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so it's nice to see someone else in the, in the building. I'm in the process of starting my own artist consulting firm. A gentleman who I represent is a phenomenal musical prodigy. He plays professionally with Chuck Brown. He has 14 Grammy nominations, 37 million albums in sales. But what, what I was thinking about while I was listening to everyone on the panel is like, there aren't too many people here, no disrespect, that's my age and my age group. So that goes to show you that, once again, the interest level has to be developed, I'll say. And what I think I might be able to bring to the table is one, I'm going to talk to the artist who I'm speaking of and see if he's interested in golf because I know that I am. My grandfather used to play and I definitely want to start learning to play because I think it's good for the mind. And it's not about money for me, it's just to, to learn the discipline to, to play this game. But I think other artists 
and people in the entertainment industry might be interested in it as well. So maybe that's something that I could bring to the table as a young entrepreneur. And then second, I'm connected to a grant writer. So for yourself here as well as others in the room, if you have um, businesses that might be able to benefit from a grant writer, this gentleman has, as well as my sister, they, they run the business together, has a, a really good track record as far excuse me, as far as getting grants through, and I'm interested in getting all of the business cards up here because I wanna, that's why I came here tonight. I wanted to network. That's what you're doing, that's what you do, man. You done that's it. That's what you do. <laughs> Thank you. You did it. Here, I'll, I'll take this. I'm gonna say, we're gonna finish out now because I wanna be generous and respectful of the panel members' time because they've been very generous and respectful with us. So I wanna close the panel now, and I think that they will be kind enough to stay around at least for a couple of minutes as time will allow them uh, with their various other uh, responsibilities and commitments um, at the CBC week this week. Um, but um, please approach them. They've all said, come and get my card. So as soon as we finish, just come on up and get their cards and talk to them. And um, uh, they will give you more information and be able to deal with uh, all the questions.